thank you very much, Mike. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be introduced by Mike Zoni, who is one of the young stars in China studies around the world, uh, having gotten a PhD at Oxford and uh, coming from Canada originally, and Harvard is very lucky to have him uh, as a professor of Chinese history. When uh, I was retiring uh, from Harvard uh, in uh, 2000, I was trying to think what I could do that would help make Americans better understand what was going on in Asia. And I decided, we need to get a little closer. Uh, I decided that, um, of course, China is the most uh, complicated uh, problem that we face in the future. And that to understand China, one of the most useful ways would be understand the transformation that took place in China that set it off on the path that it's going. Just as if you want to understand the United States, if you understand Madison, Jefferson, Washington, how they formed the country, that would be a very good basis for uh, understanding what was going on in the United States. So current China was very much shaped by Deng Xiaoping. Deng Xiaoping came to power in 1978 and he really was the dominant person uh, right up until uh, 1992 for a period of about 14 years. <clears throat> what I thought I would do in the brief time uh, today, uh, I was told to not talk more than 20 minutes, uh, would be to talk about some of the forces that shaped Deng, that made him what he was, uh, and what he did to transform China. Because in 1978, the country he inherited uh, had a per capita income of less than $100 per capita. Now it's uh, estimated somewhere around 6,000, and it's on the path that Deng uh, set it on. Uh, there, were almost, there was almost no migration from the countryside to the city. Uh, and since he came, uh, perhaps 200 million people uh, have moved from the countryside to towns and cities. Uh, when he came to uh, power, uh, the, uh, they were, the country was still involved uh, in the cultural revolution uh, and people were full of enmity toward each other. And he worked to unite the country to set it on the new path. What are some of the forces that uh, shaped him? One, uh, when he was uh, 15 years old, he was in a county high school in Guangan County in uh, Sichuan. And at that time, in the year 1919, uh, just after uh, the uh, Versailles Treaty, there was an outbreak of student movement in Beijing, where people, it was really the first budding of uh, Chinese nationalism. And uh, Deng at that time uh, was a youth in the high school, but a few high schools who were very progressive joined in the demonstrations. And Deng joined in the demonstrations. Uh, uh, Eric Erickson has talked about how certain youth at a certain time when they uh, have their identity formed with a movement or with a, an institution, it becomes very basic, central, uh, to his whole life. And so his dedication to national purpose really began uh, already at age 15. The second uh, thing I would mention is his experience in France from 1920 to 25. Uh, at, after uh, World War I, a lot of Chinese students wanted to go abroad. They didn't have the opportunities that they have today to study in the United States and Europe and Australia and Canada and get scholarships. Uh, what the idea was of some leading Chinese uh, business people was that uh, they would send students abroad who would work part time uh, and then they would uh, earn money and then they would study at universities and come back and bring what they learned to China and help build up a new strong China. At the time, uh, Deng Xiaoping uh, was 16. He was one of the youngest in the group to pass the exams uh, to go to France. Uh, and of all the countries that Chinese students wanted to go to at that time, France was the main one. During World War I, about a half a million Chinese workers went to the Soviet Union to work. And about 150,000 went to France. So there were a lot of work opportunities in France, and the Chinese thought that that was a great center of civilization. And so a group of youth uh, went to uh, France 
1920, 19, early 1920s. And from that group came uh, the Communist Youth League. What happened was, uh, th to get there, first of all, they had to be pretty well educated, and that meant their parents had to have money. So they were not from the worker class or the peasant class. They were from the landlord class and the bourgeois class. But when they got there, what they found was that there were no jobs for them, that the French uh, who survived the war had come back. Uh, France was suffering from an inflation and depression, and there weren't any jobs. And the uh, factory jobs that were available went to Frenchmen, and they saw that the uh, the capitalists were living in very lavish homes and living in a very luxurious style of life. Uh, and yet the workers were very poor. And at best, the Chinese who were over there could get dirty, greasy jobs that ordinary French workers didn't want to get. So when they formed their study groups and tried to think of what's the broader explanation of what's going on, what just happened several years earlier in the Soviet Union, 1917, made a lot of sense. It seemed like that the bourgeois uh, people were exploiting the working class and that the countries uh, that were already uh, fairly well developed were exploiting, the imperialists were exploiting those from poorer nations. And so that group that had gone to France that was so disappointed that they could not study in the universities, they were not able to save enough money to get into universities. And so they just continued to work in factories. Uh, and they, they were very disappointed disillusioned, both with their own country for not uh, coming up with scholarships when they had been encouraged to go there, and for the French government for not uh, making any effort to support them. Uh, and so they formed the Communist Youth League. The leader of this group in France uh, was Zhou Enlai, who was about six years older than Deng, and who later became premier and uh, foreign minister and uh, was the one who greeted Henry Kissinger and Nixon when they went to China in 1971-72. The third uh, experience I think that was very critical in shaping Deng's, um, his, his character and his point of view uh, was uh, in uh, the wartime from 1937 to 1949. It was a, he was in the army for 12 years and it was an active uh, wartime. So his job as political commissar in one of the leading uh, units and later as the front commander for the largest military battle in history at the White High, uh, his role was to try to rally the troops. Uh, Mao Zedong and a lot of other leaders were way back in the 1940s in uh, Yan'an, which was much more protected from outsiders. And they, they had room to talk about theory and philosophy and train new generations. Deng was on the front lines for 12 years. His job was to get ready for the next battle. He had to be pragmatic. He didn't have time to, to talk about theory and philosophy. He had learned theory in Moscow uh, after, after France, where he was for a year. But he didn't have uh, the uh, time, really, uh, to engage in the battles, uh, to engage in theoretical discussion. He was so busy with the battles. Another in important influence that I should have mentioned uh, about the year in Moscow was that when he was in Moscow was 1926 to 1927. At that time, the Soviet Union had the new economic policy. The economic policy was to have the Communist Party in charge, but to have rampant uh, markets open to foreign trade, open to foreign investments, and the Communist Party was able to provide leadership for that. <clears throat> the same, Deng had the same experience from 1949 to 52, when he was in charge of the Southwest Bureau, six provinces of Southwest China, uh, which had about 100 million people, because that was before they had what they call the socialist transformation, before they built collective and communes. So Deng had lots of experience in leading a communist party and yet having an open market economy. So after 1978, when he began to uh, develop that uh, pattern, 
of the Communist Party uh, leading uh, an open economy, it wasn't new to him. He'd already had that experience. Another important experience uh, that, that uh, helped shape Deng Xiaoping was his experience as general secretary of the party. Uh, Mao Zedong uh, had liked Mao way back in the early 1930s when Deng was criticized uh, and purged uh, for leading the Mao faction. Uh, he was uh, in uh, the uh, Jiangxi province, uh, and uh, down there he was uh, accused of uh, uh, following too closely to Mao Zedong, and he was purged for that. So that endeared Deng to Mao. Uh, Mao could see that Deng was a very capable person, very bright, very able, uh, and so they bonded uh, very early. And so from uh, the mid-1950s until 1966, the outbreak the Cultural Revolution, Deng had the experience of being the General Secretary of the Party, supervising all party activities. So while Mao, in a way, was chairman of the board uh, as a chairman of the party and uh, was uh, also a chairman of the country, uh, Deng Xiaoping had responsibility for dealing with practical issues. I think another thing that shaped Deng, uh, that was very important in shaping Deng, was the failure of the Great Leap Forward. For in 1959, uh, when the Great Leap Forward was really uh, uh, devastating the countryside, people were starving in large numbers, and the latest estimates are that perhaps 40 or 50 million people were uh, uh, died prematurely during the Great Leap Forward because of famine that was caused by the excessive zeal of Mao Zedong's established uh, commune system and moved rapidly to socialism that was not based on realities and it was not based on what was going on in the outside world. Mao had never been abroad, uh, but Deng had been abroad and had a much better sense of what was going on. Now, let me uh, move from those influences to what Deng did when he came to power in 78. Mao had died in 76, and Mao was still pursuing the revolution to the end. Uh, he wanted to shake up the country uh, and to uh, have people attack those who were uh, going what was called the capitalist road, uh, who were too free and too independent. Uh, and so the, uh, most of the senior leaders of the party were criticized and purged by Mao Zedong. So Deng Xiaoping, one, one of the first things he did uh, when he uh, took, uh, uh, came back uh, after being purged again uh, by Mao uh, in 1975, uh, one of the first things he did was to start working on education. Uh, he took over responsibility for foreign relations and education science technology in August 77 when he came back to work. Uh, Mao uh, had purged him once at the beginning of the Cultural Revolution, but he always wanted to think of Deng as somebody who might learn the lessons and be faithful to him in the long run. So while some other people who were purged died in prison, uh, Deng was sent off and the hope was by Mao uh, that he would come back and uh, work for the good of the country and really help the place grow. Well, uh, Deng, uh, when he came back, as I say, in August 1977, one of the first things he did was to open the universities and to require entrance examinations. The universities had been closed in 1966 at the beginning of the Cultural Revolution, and Deng felt that, the, that for the country to progress, of all the four modernizations, industry, agriculture, national defense, science technology education, science technology education was the most important and he wanted the students to come back to the universities and in order to do that he wanted to have entrance examinations under Mao political considerations were always very important in getting into universities and going for a higher education Mao wanted people who were absolutely red uh, Deng felt that in 1977 uh, there were no longer any uh, uh, landlords they had been wiped out early in the 1950s. There were no bourgeois people. They had been wiped out in the 1950s. And therefore, the country could go strictly by merit. 
And so entrance to, exam uh, to universities was strictly by merit. And in 1977, when Dung decided to open universities, he made it uh, entrance examinations, and those who passed got in. So the people who first passed those tests were like seven million who took the exams, and only a few hundred thousand could enter, enter universities. But that group of talented people, many of whom had worked in the countryside uh, or been involved in other labor uh, when they wanted to study, were extraordinarily thankful to Deng Xiaoping for letting them come back to the universities. Another thing that Deng did that was very basic was to send people abroad to study. When Frank Press, uh, President Carter's uh, uh, science advisor, who was an MIT professor in earth science, uh, went uh, to uh, China in the summer of 1978, they, they had just begun talks on no normalization. And Deng said to uh, Frank Press, we want to send hundreds of students to uh, the United States as soon as we normalize relations, and we want tens of thousands to go later. Are you ready to accept them? Uh, poor Frank Press didn't know quite what to do. He phoned Jimmy Carter in the middle of the night. And I interviewed uh, Jimmy Carter uh, about uh, his role in uh, relating to Dung. And he said Frank Press didn't need to wake him up in the middle of the night. But he was awakened at 3 AM. And he said, sure, go ahead. So uh, Dung was ready to go ahead and send all these students to abroad. Uh, now, over one million have been abroad. Uh, and Deng, uh, Deng's uh, students were able to achieve what he was not able to achieve in the 1920s, the opportunity to learn from worldwide what was going on. One of the biggest reforms that, Ma, uh, that Deng made was decollectivization. Uh, and he, to manage this politically was really quite extraordinary because many people who, who were dedicated communists uh, and many of those who worked in the countryside felt that the commune system was basic and that the collectivization was the basis of what they were trying to do. Deng managed to handle this politically beautifully. Uh, he didn't do like an American politician of standing up in a campaign and saying, I'm going to do, I'm going to decollectivize. Not at all. What he did uh, was to allow one of his best friends, uh, Wan Li, uh, to go as first party secretary to the province of Anhui, which had some of the biggest starvation. And uh, he told uh, uh, Wan Li, uh, if people are starving, you got to let them do whatever they can to find a way uh, to uh, earn their own, grow their own food, and survive and not starve to death. And even the conservatives couldn't oppose that. And so Wan Li let local peasants decide what they could do uh, to get ahead. And sure enough, a lot of them began farming their own family plots and broke off from the big collectives. And then what Deng did, he sent some uh, journalists uh, to Anhui to observe what happened and report. And they reported in Beijing uh, that uh, there was a lot of progress. Uh, production had gone way up in those areas where they tried it. And then Deng announced that if people really wanted to, uh, and in areas where there was a serious uh, a famine, uh, that they should be allowed on a broader scale to find a way uh, to uh, make, produce goods on their own. And within a year or so, uh, over 90% of the country had decollectivized. It was a way, it was a brilliant way in which Deng kept the support of the conservatives. He didn't go out on any limb. Uh, and he let the thing develop gradually uh, so that more people supported. In, in the fall of 78, it's, it's part, uh, one of the reasons why I mentioned his fall in, in, the culture of, in the culture of evolution as being so important is because it led him to think that China needed to go a very different path. And one of the important things was of uh, also forming good relations uh, with uh, the major countries from which they would learn. He had already been to Europe in 1974 and 1975, as well as 1920 to 25. So in the visit to the United Nations in 74 in New York, to France in 74 and France in 75, 
and to Southeast Asia uh, in early 1978, he had a good idea what was going on in the outside world. But he wanted others to get that same kind of message. So in the summer of 1978, he, uh, I'm sorry, it was May 1978, he encouraged the delegation Gumu, led by Gumu, a prime minister, uh, a, a, vice, a, a deputy minister, uh, to lead a group of people from all the major economic units, all the major uh, economic commission, planning commission, uh, construction commission, and uh, large ministries concerned with various kinds of industries, to take a five-week tour of uh, Europe. When they came back, uh, some people thought that it was led by a man named Gu Mu. And when they came back, some people thought that uh, they would have a meeting that lasted a couple hours. They started at 3 p.m., finished at 12 midnight. And what the group reported was that China was far behind the West, much further behind than they thought. Also, however, the, the European countries were ready to lend money and help out with their technology. So rather than being discouraged by being so far behind Europe, they were very excited about what they could do as a result of, of that visit. So in the 1980s, another thing that Deng did uh, was to begin to open up markets to the outside world. And here, Hong Kong was played a very key role. Uh, he knew that if he uh, immediately said that uh, the whole country should have markets, that the conservatives would uh, be infuriated and it'd be a lot of polarization. What he did was say, let's try some experiments. If they work in some place, we'll just see. And he allowed some of these uh, special economic zones down near Hong Kong in Shenzhen, Zhuhai, Shantou, and uh, also Xiamen uh, along the southeast coast, areas from which a lot of Chinese had migrated uh, overseas uh, to begin to open up little zones. And he also knew that the people who had migrated overseas often had been successful business people and would be willing to invest in their own local area. So he let them begin to bring in uh, money. And because the, the government of Beijing was so short of money, they relied heavily on these uh, outside investors to provide the funds that were necessary to get those experiments started. And once those experiments started, then Deng encouraged the high-level leaders to go visit Shenzhen, see the progress. And of course, they were all stunned by the new industry and construction that they saw in Shenzhen. And that that built up a broader base of support so that those experiments could, when successful, then began to spread to other localities. Uh, uh, in 1989, uh, Deng faced a very serious problem of uh, student demonstrations. The students said, uh, uh, well, uh, let me back up. In the beginning of 1989, uh, Gorbachev was invited to uh, Beijing to uh, bring back good relations with the Soviet Union. They had been broken off in 63 by Deng himself when he went to Moscow to argue with Sislov. But in 1989, uh, he invited Gorbachev and his wife to come, and on the conditions that uh, they, they pull out of Afghanistan, they pull the troops back from the northern Chinese border, uh, and that Vietnam pull out of Cambodia, and Gorbachev accepted Deng's conditions. So Deng invited the uh, news people from all over the world uh, to come to Beijing. But when they got there, what they found was some student demonstrations. They started out over the death of Hu Yaobang, who was a very progressive, open leader who suddenly died suddenly. Uh, and uh, the students uh, were so upset that uh, their beloved leader had died. He wanted more democracy and he wanted more openness. Uh, and so they began uh, to demonstrate. There was still a lot of uh, political control over students and ordinary people. Uh, that upset them, and so there were a lot of urban support for the students who were demonstrating. Uh, and um, uh, the result is they had huge demonstrations, and after, after Gorbachev left, uh, they still didn't quiet down, 
and so Deng uh, warned them that uh, they, if they didn't quiet down, he would have to uh, take some sterner steps. Uh, and on May 20th of 1989, he brought in the troops unarmed to try to get control, but they couldn't get control. Uh, they ran into all kinds of obstacles from the people uh, who didn't want troops coming into the city. Uh, and so uh, he supported what other leaders decided to do uh, to allow uh, the troops to do what was ev whatever was necessary to regain order. And on June 3rd, June 4th, uh, they entered the city. And the best uh, data we have is that as many as seven or 800 people uh, were killed on the streets of Beijing during that crackdown. I think if I had written my book uh, 20 years ago, uh, nobody would have paid attention to it because people were so upset at uh, what Deng did to crack down on June 4th that nobody would want to think about his historical role. I have no, uh, I, in my book, I try to be very clear exactly what Deng did in cracking down on June 4th and there's still a lot of people who feel that was a terrible thing. But I think as we look at Chinese history, we have to recognize his historical contribution. Uh, if we look at uh, people like uh, Thomas Jefferson uh, and George Washington, they owned slaves, lots of slaves. That was a terrible thing. It was an inhumane thing. If we were to think about their role in history just on the owning of slavery, we would have missed a lot about what they did to form their country. And I think Deng Xiaoping, it was a complicated character. He did crack down. He felt that they needed to, to, to uh, keep the peace and allow the country to grow. But he also led the country uh, to uh, modernization. Since he came to power, perhaps 300 million people have come out of poverty and are now living fairly comfortable lives. Uh, the countryside uh, has uh, turned into an uh, open area. He's brought modernization, technology, uh, raised the standard of living, uh, and uh, now the Chinese people have really joined the world. They've entered international organizations. Students have come across and come back to China, bringing new technology, new ideas. And so that it's really transformed the country. I think if you personally, that if you try to think which leader of the 20th century did more to change the shape of world history, I think there's a strong argument that maybe it was Deng Xiaoping because several hundred million people are out of poverty. Uh, the country uh, people uh, got wealthy, uh, much wealthier, uh, raised their standard of living, and he really changed the balance of world power. Because in 1978, China was a weak country. It was not uh, considered an important country in the world affairs. And today, China ranks up just under the United States in terms of its influence in world affairs. So I think, in short, we have a very remarkable man. And what I've tried to do is, as objectively as I can, uh, record uh, what people consider as good points and bad points and to recognize the extraordinary role that he's played in remaking history. Thank you. You're joining us at Cambridge Forum with China scholar Ezra Vogel discussing his acclaimed biography of China's transformational leader, Deng Xiaoping. Ezra, when you were talking about his uh, uh, life in the military, in the army, you, you, you mentioned that he was pragmatic and too busy for theory, which is ironic given that he's the author of <laughs> Deng Xiaoping theory, which now students in China all have to study. Um, one of the interesting things I found in the book was the suggestion that some of the reforms for which he's famous were actually begun under his predecessor, interim leader Hua Guofeng. Um, some of his other reforms in agriculture and with opening markets, for example, involved transferring practices that had been tried out in places like South Korea uh, and Taiwan. Was Deng Xiaoping a visionary? Was he simply a good learner, or was, as, he suggests, as you suggest in the conclusion of the book, a competent manager? 
Well, I, I go for the confident manager, if I had to put <laughs> one phrase. Be, because the idea of reform and opening was yet not unique to Deng Xiaoping. And even Hua Guofeng, who, is, who was criticized, his successor, the one that Mao chose to be his successor, uh, who turned out not to be really a great strong leader, uh, was in favor of a lot of those reforms. And a lot of the senior officials were in favor of a lot of those reforms. To some extent, he did have a very long time perspective. I don't know whether visionary is the right word, but when he thought about Hong Kong, he th said, you know, for 50 years they can keep the present system. If you asked Obama, you know, what he planned to do for the next 50 years for his country, uh, that would hardly be a serious question. I mean, no American leader can, you know, four years is long term. Uh, and to think uh, to the end of the end of your term to the next election. So I think he did have a long term perspective. At the same time, he was experimental and he didn't have fixed notions. And uh, he used the expression, uh, cross the river by groping for stones. Uh, and that wasn't, again, that, that term was somehow attributed to Deng, but it wasn't unique to him. He didn't invent the term. Uh, he, he used the terms, he used the ideas, and he was the manager who put it all together and provided the direction and the firm hand that made it all happen. You also talked about his skill as a politician in pushing, uh, pushing through the decollectivization reforms. We've seen just this week uh, with the ouster of one of the uh, leading stars in the firmament of, uh, of young leaders in China that personality politics and factional politics remain very important in China. What enabled Deng to be so successful at managing and reconciling factional interests and factional differences? Well, one thing I think he had the authority that came from working very closely with Mao and with Zhou Enlai. Uh, he had worked very closely with both of them. He had learned foreign relations from Zhou Enlai, 73, 75. He had worked under Zhou Enlai in France as a young man. Uh, and he also worked very closely uh, with Mao. Uh, but I think it was also, uh, he was smart, he remembered things, and he had a per, uh, perspective on history. Uh, when I interviewed Li Guan Yu about uh, Deng Xiaoping, uh, Li Guan Yu, who had met many of the world's leaders, said he thought Deng was as great a leader as he met, because he was able to recognize that what he had learned and what he had put into practice was not working. And he was ready to try something new, but step by step in a way that people could accept it. Uh, and that would not add to polarization, but would help resolve the polarization. That's a, a skill that many politicians could benefit from having. It's extraordinary. Welcome to Cambridge Forum as we continue our discussion of Deng Xiaoping and the transformation of China with the Dean of Harvard's China scholars, Ezra Vogel. What role did Deng play in bringing China to the place it holds today as powerful player in the Pacific Rim and the international economy? At this point in the program, we'll take questions from the audience. Please line up at the microphone and ask one question. We want to give as many of you as possible a chance to ask your questions. Thank you. I'm wondering if you would care to go off from this chronological history about what Deng did to develop the country into its cultural anthropology and its political philosophy. As the great Chinese miracle is blooming, there are tens of thousands of Chinese, particularly in Africa and other parts of the world, that are gathering resources to feed the great dragon, if you want to call it that. and how the Chinese people that are in these foreign countries are absorbing information, education, whether they want to stay within the countries that they visited or are they pledged or dedicated to return. So talk about the Han, about the, the Tibetan Buddhist, stuff like that in the scheme of this development of China. Oh. Think 30, 40 years out for us. Uh, my uh, field was sociology and anthropology, so I'm very happy to make a few comments. First of all, uh, although Mao was revolutionary in theory, he blocked mobility. 
uh, he uh, led people in the rural uh, countryside, had to stay in their commune, they couldn't move to the city. And people who worked in a certain unit uh, in the city were uh, bonded to that unit and they couldn't move easily to other units. And the housing was owned by the state. So what Dung did by opening up um, migration, allowing people to move from the countryside to the city as they had enough food to feed the city population, completely transformed a society that had been uh, really rigid and locked in to one that was mobile. Uh, the old family system in a lot of the rural areas uh, was not preserved when you, you moved so rapidly and where the people in the city only had uh, one child. As for the Chinese going overseas, there are many different kinds of reasons and many different kinds of Chinese going overseas. Some are diplomats who want to keep good relations. Uh, some are working for Xinhua in a private capacity to try to find out what's going on and pass it up through the hierarchy to the leaders so that they're well informed of what goes there. Some are companies that are out there to make money uh, and look at investments. Some are energy companies that are sent by the state uh, to try to establish uh, solid sources of energy that will continue to fuel China as it continues to have more automobiles and uh, more steel plants uh, and uh, make, make uh, remake China. So maybe uh, that's a quick answer to some of your concerns, but I think that's a very quick overview. I just have one comment and one question for Professor Walker. The comment is the underpinning, what underlines of what you just described, all he did. That is his uncanny and unrivaled ability to seize power. For, for example, and shortly after he was reinstored in office, he started restructuring restructuring the, the, the core of the Chinese Communist Party leadership. And the, uh, the other example is that the staging the, the war against Vietnam in 1979, that the real purpose was to challenge the, the, the chairman of the Communist Party at the time, the nominal as he was. Soon after that, the Communist Party chief was marginalized and eventually thrown out of the leadership. So. I, Without his unrivaled ability to seize the top power within the Chinese Communist Party, nothing would be possible. So the question is, it just very recently, uh, there has allegedly been, a, uh, within the core of the Chinese Communist Authority, been tentative proposal to re at least read evaluate the decision of the Tiananmen Massacre. Of course, this being highly controversial within the core of the, 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 the uh, communist authorities. So I, I want to comment on the impact, the destabilizing impact on the Chinese Communist Party, um, on the, the, the turning the table around on this issue. Uh, first, uh, in first year uh, assumption, uh, general comment, I, it is true, of course, uh, anybody uh, had, to, had to have a firm grip on power uh, to carry out his activities. Uh, and it is true that uh, Hua Guofeng was pushed aside uh, within uh, two years after the Vietnam War. But I don't think those are related. I, I, I talked to um, Lee Guan Yu, who, who uh, followed the Vietnam War very carefully, and I talked to many others and uh, went through the records of the war. And what Deng was concerned about in 1979 when he invaded Vietnam uh, was that the Soviets and the Vietnamese were cooperating. The United States had pulled out of Vietnam. He was very worried 
that uh, the Soviet Union and the Vietnam were going to circle around uh, and circle China. Uh, da Nang uh, base was being used by uh, Soviet ships uh, and uh, there was a real danger of encirclement and that, that was the uh, reason why he went to war uh, Vietnam. There were plenty of other ways to, to push uh, Hua Guofeng aside and he didn't have to do much of the pushing. It was done by others. Uh, basically it was done in November uh, 1978 by a group of seniors, Ye Jianning, Li Xianian and others, uh, while Deng was in the Southeast Asia uh, that they uh, basically began to push uh, Hua Guofeng aside. Uh, secondly, on, on, on the question about uh, June 4th, uh, it is true that there are a lot of people uh, in China who feel that those who were criticized for forming demonstrations and so forth uh, should be considered patriots and that their cases should be reversed. They should no longer be considered uh, people who challenge the order but who help the order. Uh, because there are certain people living who, who were deeply involved uh, in the June 4th, and I'm thinking particularly Li Peng and also the successor who wasn't there but succeeded after that, Jiang Zemin. I think it, it's un, my, my best friends who know about inside power things in China suggest that it would probably take uh, many more years. They do expect uh, that there will be a reversal of verdicts on Tiananmen, but probably not during Li Peng's lifetime, and perhaps not during Jiang Zemin's lifetime. Thank you. Professor Vogel, um, I appreciate your comments on the experimental nature of Deng and his reforms. Um, and as we observe, China has been going through a long history of reform without blueprints. And I also wonder, I haven't read your book, I'm sorry, but you probably read, uh, have written it in, in your book, but I'm just curious, when you said that he had a long-term vision of Hong Kong, the 50 years, did he have a similar vision on Taiwan, the sovereignty of Taiwan and Tibet? And if so, had it been going his way? Uh, thank you, Wen Hao. Uh, first of all, thank you for all your help at the Asia Center and the Fairbanks Center. Uh, um, he did have a long vision uh, for Taiwan. He wanted Taiwan also to have the same system for 50 years, and he, he was ready not even to station troops in Taiwan, let them have their own troops. Uh, but unfortunately, he wasn't able to resolve the Taiwan issue. And what he thought was most critical was that America was still sending arms to Taiwan, and therefore Taiwan was not willing uh, to begin to negotiate. And they felt that they, as long as the United States was behind, they didn't have to negotiate. So now we have a very complicated situation. One, it's a situation, one of the tensions between the United States and China is over Taiwan, because as America sells arms to Taiwan, uh, then Taiwan does not want to have political integration with the mainland feel they can remain independent. Uh, and that, that's very disturbing. Uh, he had hoped that in his lifetime he would achieve the unification of Taiwan. I think the most bitter disappointment he had with his achievements is he was not able to bring Taiwan back into the mainland. But surely it would gladden his heart then to see the business elites in Taiwan now talking about reunification becoming inevitable. Uh, I, it certainly would. <laughs> Um, Professor, I have a question um, about the current new administration. Uh, China is going through changing of guards this year, and that the recent scandal with the Bo Xilai, it seems like there is co you know, comment that China is going to go backward, it's going to be less open. Um, I wonder what is your view about the new administration, are they following the path of Deng Xiaoping becoming more open market reform or you think that is kind of going backward? 
there are a lot of things we don't know. And in the United States, before a person takes office, we have election campaigns, which are constant exposure to TV and press conferences. Uh, uh, now, uh, Xi Jinping, who's going to be the new successor, keeps quiet as possible. Uh, he knows that uh, if he speaks out, it may disrupt things. And it's very difficult, therefore, to analyze what he would do. He's not telling what he would do. He's not stating his policies. One can say a few things from his background, I think, that gives some clues. One is when he was in Fujian as a party secretary, he was very open. Uh, secondly, that when he met foreigners in Australia and Japan uh, and in Iowa, uh, they feel that he's a very open man that they can deal with in a very frank and direct way, and that he's very bright. The third thing I would say, uh, judge, judging by his father, uh, Xi Zhongxun, uh, who was very unusual. Uh, he was one of the leaders of this new opening, the new special economic zones, and was out on the front in doing that. And also, uh, Hu Yaobang uh, was criticized and thrown out in January 87. He was known as the most liberal and open-minded of all the Chinese leaders. There was only one leader that stood up for Hu Yaobang at that time. That's Xi Jinping's father. So I think there is some reason for hope that Xi Jinping will be a more open leader and, to, and continue reforms uh, more than the present leader is doing. I guess I have a very uh, related question. So I guess many people say the transformation of China is not yet complete. Uh, and the leaders, the transformation of China uh, is not yet complete. Yes. Um, and then the, the part people have done, or Deng Xiaoping has done, is mostly uh, economical transformation. And then the political transformation is predicted to be more difficult. Um, it may involve more interest groups. And so what do we learn from uh, Deng's um, leadership skills um, and the strategy he used? And then can we, how, how much can we apply uh, those experiences in the political transformation in the next. Uh, as you know, there was a, a now had an expression, a continuous revolution. And I think one could use the word continuous reform. Uh, it's not just one stage that it's all done forever. I think the reforms and opening will continue. And I think, for example, the rule of law will become more important. However, I don't think that necessarily they're going to, we should expect them to f follow Western-style democracy. It's not clear to me that that is their vision. I think they do need to find a way to have broader public representation so that the leaders have a broader base of legitimacy just in perpetuating the Communist Party. And they're experimenting with various uh, means in the Communist Party of, of voting the National People's Congress. There's more voting, there's more dissent. There are more cases where you select a group of potential leaders and let the people concerned choose which of that group. Uh, and so these ex experiments with the village elections. So I think that these uh, experiments will continue and that reforms of many kinds will continue for many years. I think particularly now that uh, corruption has become so widespread and such a serious problem that Xi Jinping, I think, will have to take firmer steps to deal with corruption than the current leader does. Thank you, Mr. Vocal. You know, I'm a temporary, you know, Cambridge resident. <laughs> My wife is taking, you know, treatment in MBGH. <clears throat> so <clears throat> I think, you know, Vocal, Mr. Vocal is a well-known Chinese expert, you know, highly evaluated by the Chinese, you know, academic and uh, intellectual, uh, you know, community. <laughs> And uh, <clears throat> I think, you know, uh, what you talk about, you know, they talked about uh, Deng Xiaoping's character, Deng Xiaoping is, you know, competent, you know, leader, I all agree with you. He's very good. He opened the door 30 some years ago, 
I'm one of the benefic- uh, benefit person, you know. I come to United States 32 years ago. <coughs> but <coughs> Deng Xiaoping is a good decision maker. He made a decision very quick, but sometimes he made it too quick, you know. <coughs> so, 1989, June 4th, that trouble is caused by his own mistake. Yeah. If he don't discharge the general secretary, Hu Yaobang, you know, it won't have so many students after Hu Yaobang passed away and get on the street. So <clears throat> this is Deng Xiaoping, one of the, his big mistakes. Yeah. Also, he... Can we follow Deng's lead as a quick decision maker yeah. and move to a quick question, <laughs> possibly? Yeah, yeah. but uh, I want to say something. You know. <laughs> and he is also not a good reader. He's a good leader, but not a good reader. All his spare time is a play the part, you know, bridge. <laughs> he played the bridge with the people, you know. And he promoted his bridge partner to be high position. So it makes some mistake. You know, I don't want to waste people's money, uh, that pe- people's time. I will buy you a book, you know. <laughs> I will ask you a biograph, you know, and uh, I appreciate this, my comments to your talk. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, I think um, Dung did play bridge uh, often once or twice a week, uh, but it's not true that all the people he played bridge with uh, were uh, promoted. Uh, one of his, I, I was able to interview one or two of his bridge uh, players. Uh, Wu Meng Yu is one of them, and he was certainly not promoted. He was a brilliant bridge player. Uh, all, <laughs> Also, uh, Dung uh, tried to, uh, when he played bridge, he often got in as a bridge playing star. He thought it was a good mental exercise to, to think about bridge. And so uh, he, often had, he ha- often had a partner who was a bridge playing uh, star, and the, uh, and the other side also had one. So he thought that would uh, improve his own uh, skill. Uh, he also liked to uh, play pocket pool. Uh, to uh, uh, billiards. Uh, he often uh, played that also. Thank you. Uh, for a time, I administered a program at Harvard Medical School that brought Chinese students here to learn about AIDS, I think it was, but basic sciences. Uh, and the interesting thing is that students were all very bright and they knew their facts, but if the Teachers said, the professor said, the moon is made of green cheese, they wrote that down. They never questioned anything. And so one of the Chinese American professors deliberately gave the wrong instructions for a lab experiment. And then when the lab experiment didn't work, he said, and you believe me? I mean, what my question is, is this still true of Chinese students? Are they learning to question even the learned professors? Uh, since China has 1.3 billion people, there is quite a bit of variation. But I, but I think that there's a very strong kernel of truth that is still true. The, that uh, in the better high schools, the key point is to get ready for the university exams. And that's learning facts and mastering information, and they do that very well. And the critical judgment uh, is not something uh, that they, there's as much as part of the Chinese education is a, a part of ours. However, they've had 1.1 million people who've gone abroad. A lot of them have spent enough time here that they have more critical minds and over 300,000 of that group have now gone back and a lot of them have become teachers at key universities. So there is an attempt in, in many universities to try to develop uh, critical 
critical thinking in a bigger way. But still, I think the dominant uh, pattern is still uh, learn the facts, learn the information, and uh, see who is the brightest to get the information to get in the next uh, level of examination. But I think it's also this fundamental issue that you draw attention to, uh, that is the people are not taught to think critically. I don't know what, if, if this was your experience, but I think in some ways we're the beneficiary of that here at Harvard because yes. we get students who have rejected that uh, and demand yes. critical thinking. Those are some of our very brightest and best. That, that, and they, they first passed exams, and beyond that, they also develop critical they thinking. Yeah, they ask, they ask questions, and they. Yes. Professor Vogel, I imagine that uh, it will be 10 or 20 years before another biography about Deng Xiaoping at the level of yours is going to be written. When that book is written, what would you like to see it cover that your book was not able to cover? <laughs> That's a great question. Uh, and I, when I was writing it, I was afraid that somebody else might beat me to it. Uh, but there, there is nobody else who's done anything comparable, and it would take a few years to get anything comparable, and I had a lot of good luck, some of which was having so many Chinese students here who developed connections that I could interview a lot of people that uh, ordinary people could not interview. Uh, when I hosted Jiang Zemin in 1998, uh, I was able to interview him about Deng Xiaoping, and I don't know of anybody else who's interviewed him. One source of information, of course, is going to come out, and that is a lot of the stories of the meetings uh, and a lot of the rich detail of discussions and I think uh, records of meetings will come out and it will give a much richer picture of uh, the decision-making process because Dung did not keep notes. It's tough for a biographer of Dung, uh, but I think what I would like to see uh, you know, I may not be around to see, you know, 10, 20 years, the new biographies that come, but I, I hope they would make full use of, of records that give a richer picture of the actual decision-making process in consideration of what happened that I, I could sort of guess, but I, I couldn't nail down. Thank you. You spent... Uh, gave us a very rich picture of the factors that contributed to Dung's success. Now I know you don't have a lot more time with us tonight, but aside from June 4th, what were some of the big setbacks or challenges that he faced during this long, long career? Well, the three times he was purged, uh, the first time was in the Jiangxi period. He was, uh, he had been county chief at, uh, uh, at Regin County, uh, and uh, he uh, was thrown out of that job. Uh, and for six months, it uh, wasn't clear he would survive. Uh, but one of the people, uh, Li Fuchun, who had been with him in France, uh, who was then head of the provincial party committee, brought him on to uh, take charge of um, propaganda for the provincial committee. The second time, of course, that he was purged was uh, in 1966 by Mao himself at the beginning of the Cultural Revolution as one of the two leaders in authority who were taking the capitalist road. The third time was in the end of 1975, early 76, when Mao again uh, purged him for fear that he would not follow his uh, path to continue the revolution and to continue respect for what Mao had uh, done. Um, so I think those were all the kinds of things uh, that were setbacks. But I think in terms of things that you might call errors or uh, I think another error he made was in 1988 when he was in a hurry. It's true that he was in a big hurry. And the person he was paired with, uh, Chun Yun, uh, worked very closely with him uh, and was in some respect uh, a much more cautious person. And when they worked together, they often accomplished much, much more. Uh, in 1988, Deng was in such a hurry to release prices. He, did, he he knew he was going to end his career soon and that he wanted to finish that off before he retired. And so he released all kinds of prices at the time when there were already inflationary pressures. So that 
made inflation go way sky high, and that's part of the reason so many people in, in Beijing uh, were no longer enthusiastic about dung as they had been before. Hi, uh, Professor. Uh, thank you very much for uh, presenting uh, this history to American people. And uh, I'm 40 years old. I'm uh, from Beijing. And uh, this is not only the history of his person, it's also the history of uh, a lot of people of my uh, generation. And uh, I grew up with his uh, uh, policies. And uh, I, uh, I think this is uh, great to uh, let more American people to uh, know better about what he did, uh, in fact, uh, in China, but not just through all those superficial uh, events, uh, reportings from uh, the newspapers. So uh, this is my fourth book already. <laughs> so, uh, I uh, usually uh, bought them to uh, uh, as gift to uh, American or other people, all those who are uh, willing to know better about Chinese history during the past 30 years. So my question will be very simple. Uh, this is the history for the future and uh, for the near future. Uh, what's your point of view between, uh, uh, I mean, uh, what's your point of view uh, of uh, the China's rise and the American relative decline? Uh, will they be partners or will they be enemies? Um, I think uh, there will be a lot of tensions between China and the United States. Um, as Kissinger pointed out uh, in his book, you know, for eight presidents, once we were being with Nixon, all of them have felt we must be engaged with China and must work with China. So even though there's a lot of tension and competition, in the end, uh, I think it's in leaders' interest. The leaders of both countries recognize that it's in their interest to contain the pressures for uh, uh, competition and for particularly for distrust. I think the most critical single problem uh, we, we now refer to with the term strategic mistrust. And I think it's that we are not sure of Chinese military intentions and they are not confident about Americans. Uh, we say, of course, we want to engage in China, but they suspect maybe we really don't. And we, uh, we hear the Chinese leaders say they want a peaceful rise, but then in the South China Sea, uh, they have many patrol boats that are uh, uh, in, in coming in conflict with the patrol boats from other countries. So I think it's going to take a lot of determination on, on the part of a lot of leaders and much more open discussion of military goals and uh, much more transparency in military uh, preparedness on both sides in order to achieve the kind of cooperation and peaceful future that we all want. China faces a lot of challenges today, not just internationally. Many of them challenges created either by the policies that Deng implemented or, or uh, arising out of issues that occurred on his watch. China faces a looming demographic uh, challenge, uh, both in terms of declining numbers of, of working age people uh, and declining the, a, a terrible sex ratio imbalance as a result of the one-child policy extraordinary environmental challenges, driven in part by the expansion of the economy, uh, political challenges driven in part by the creation of a middle class, which is demanding new rights, uh, and so on. Uh, Deng has gone to meet Marx, but if he were still on the scene, what would he think were the biggest challenges facing China, and what would he be doing about them? Uh, I think that's a brilliant summation of the issues that they're facing. I, I think uh, if Deng were still alive today, perhaps the biggest issue he would think of is corruption. Because Deng always thought of political support as very key to uh, power. It was one of the most fundamental things he was concerned with. And with so much corruption, there is a danger that people will no longer support the leaders and the Communist Party. And 
And when he was stepping down in 1992, uh, he said, you know, we must use two fists. We must grab reform with one fist, and we must grab illegal behavior, corruption with the other fist. And I think he's, of course, uh, much stronger and had a stronger base of power than the leaders do nowadays. But if he were alive, he would certainly attack that very vigorously. But I think in terms of openness and relate, I think also he would work very hard to, to deal with that strategic mistrust with the outside world. He felt the Soviet Union had made a terrible error by having enemies, spending so much on the military, and uh, exhausting the nation on trying to maintain a small military when they didn't build up their own country. And he would uh, uh, slow down the growth of the military and uh, work to have better relations with all major powers, including Japan especially. Uh, but I think that he would also uh, want to uh, make sure that, that they didn't spend so much on the military. Thank you, Ezra Vogel. You've been listening to a program of Cambridge Forum recorded in March 2012, co-sponsored by the First Parish in Cambridge, Unitarian Universalist, the Lowell Institute, and the Friends of Cambridge Forum. For a CD of this forum on Deng Xiaoping and the transformation of China featuring China expert Ezra Vogel, or for additional information about our ongoing radio series and our forum network webcasts, visit us on the web at cambridgeforum.org. In Harvard Square, I'm Michael Sony. Thanks for joining us.